I would like to now welcome Louise Sherman and Sarah Pine up, and they're going to speak to us about quite a number of things. Uh, Ian mentioned a book a moment ago that uh, sort of set our church's heart a little bit alight in uh, Indigenous elements as well. And Sarah asked Louise was one of the two people that put this book together. And for those who don't know, it's the most fantastic book and effectively it's, it's like an Indigenous walk through the Bible. And so on one page you'll have a story that reflects uh, an area of the scriptures and then on the other side of it there'll be a piece of Indigenous art which reflects that story. And it sort of starts at Genesis 1 and goes through to Revelation. Not every passage of the Bible gets covered but that's the cadence of the book and it is just so wonderful to sit down and have a look at the scriptures from that perspective and see the scriptures brought to life in Indigenous art. So Alex got a couple of these here as well. I don't, have I done the wrong thing and said these are available? Yeah, no, 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 that's all good. That's all, all good. good, that's good. So these <laughs> books are available. See, Alec, I saw he's got two in his box there and I'm pretty sure that if we have a run on these and we want 15, that could be organised. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Louise, for coming. Louise is from Adelaide. Sarah is from Brisbane. They've come here tonight to speak to us and it's such a privilege to have you with us. Look forward to what you're going to share with us. Wonderful, thank you. Um, now, I'm not sure that I need that one. <laughs> Um, no, I've actually got two clickers, so it's, I think this is the one. It's the other one. It's the other one? Yeah. Okay, so that's, yeah, all good, so I'll give you that one. <laughs> okay. Um, as Peter said, my name is Louise Sherman and I work for Bible Society's Remote and Indigenous Ministry Support Team um, and Sarah is here as well, uh, Sarah Pine, she's in our Church and Relations Team from Brisbane. But, and I'll uh, introduce Sarah in a moment um, and I'll get her to share a little bit with you. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to say a big thank you to you as a congregation mm. because every time I come, and this is my third time here, I've really felt your heart and your passion for mission. And I think what you do here is, is fantastic. Um, the mission week that you have here, the flags, the flag talk, I think it's brilliant. I always go back to Adelaide and tell everyone about it and say, you guys should be doing this because it's, it's so good. Um, and so I just wanted to say that I appreciate your heart and your passion um, and uh, I just want to encourage you as a church to keep, keep going with it. It's fantastic. Um, now, the first year I came, I spoke about what was called the Pichinjara New Testament Audio Recording um, and uh, that was the first project, I believe, that uh, Bible Society and Fig Tree partnered together with. Um, it was a uh, recording of the New Testament it was what's called a multi-voice recording. So we had a, a, about 50 different Pichinjara speakers um, that each did different characters. We actually had four Jesus, like we had a Jesus from each of the Gospels, um, and we had all the different characters. And uh, it was something like 500 hours of recording. And that we did two intensives, which were 12-week long recording sessions, um, six days a week. Um, and uh, we got that all done and we had it and I think last time I spoke we had just had the recordings done and we were on the verge of a distribution tour and we were going to take the recordings out into the community, into the APY lands. And uh, so and as you can see there, I think it, um, you guys helped support that project and then we have the distribution tour um, and you can see there that middle image is actually um, a phone and we have the audio available, it was available on an app for download and it was also available on a Proclaimer device and I believe Jonathan played you some of the Proclaimer um, on Sunday so um, I'll play you some of the, uh, the phone app in a minute but before I do I'll get Sarah to share because she came along on our distribution tour uh, with us so I'll get her to share some of the stories from that time um, and that experience that she had. So, thanks, Louise. Thanks, Louise. So, I came in at the easy end. I wasn't involved with any of the translation work, so I got to go along and have the fun part of going out for distribution. So, as you can see, and the map doesn't really do it justice, which is why we've put the amount of <laughs> kilometres travelled on there, we went through three different states. Who knew that the tri-state border was not actually straight? Did anybody else know that? I didn't know that. I got there and thought, wow, didn't they get this wrong when they were coming in? But, you know, that's a little bit off course. But I, just, I like to share that because not everybody knows that fun fact. 
So we travelled well over 2,000 kilometres. It was just such an incredible journey. What an incredible landscape we have in the centre of Australia. If you've never been there, I highly suggest at some stage you go and visit this incredible part of the world. But I just want to introduce the team. We broke into two teams because we did have 17 communities to cover during this launch. So I was part of what we called the West team and we're over on the left. And so that's me at the front looking as glamorous as ever. It's the wonderful Paul Eckert. Some of you may or may not know Paul. He's standing behind me. To the left of us, we have Dennis and Kathleen White, who are from the Salvation Army, who came along with us. And to the left, we have Stuart and um, Marianne. Sorry, Stuart and Marianne, who are Stuart's part of Bible Society, and Marianne's his wonderful wife. So we're in one team, and then we split into the other, and you can see Louise and Jonathan looking in their finest in a creek bed there. There was lots of camping in swags on the side of the road wherever you could find some space. So that's where my um, faith first started getting tested on this journey with dingoes sniffing around my swag. It was interesting for a girl from the city who'd never been bush before. I had to learn very quickly what sleeping in a swag meant. So off we went now, two teams. Sorry, we've also got at the front on the photo on the right, we've got Dave Barnett. So Dave heads up the translation project in Ernabella in South Australia. And then Dean also behind him does some work for Bible Society as well. So off we went out into communities. And basically what that looked like, as you can see from the photos, excuse my intense concentration there, we would pull up into community in a big four-wheel drive. We would pull open the back of the four-wheel drive and we would quite often have the proclaimer playing. We would pull up in front of the community store because that's where most of the people gathered or we could get word out really quickly that we were in the community and people would hear the audio playing and just flock to the four-wheel drive asking us what was happening and what was going on. And so we had people asking us what was happening, we were finding out where different people were in the community so that we could take proclaimers out, but we were having phones as soon as we told people that there was an app available, just phones thrust into our hands with people just wanting this app on their phone. And I can't tell you how many times somebody would hand me their phone and we would have storage issues in trying to download the app. And I don't know if any of you have ever had that problem, but we did encounter it quite a fair bit. And I would say to people, oh, we, we might need to remove some games or something so we can actually fit this app on your phone. And I cannot tell you the amount of people that just said, reset the phone, wipe everything. Because if I can have the Bible on my phone, in my language, nothing else matters. And for me, that, that really made me start to think, wow, Am I so strong in my faith that I would hand my phone to someone and say, just wipe everything if all I can have on my phone is the Bible, is God's word? So you can see we were, some of the people that we were um, speaking with there, we went off into community centres, we went to art centres, we went to nursing homes. You can see Paul up there with... A lovely lady, we just interrupted her during her art painting and she was so thrilled to not only see Paul but have a proclaimer in her hand because she was actually responsible for running the church services in the nursing home. And just after that photo was taken, along with the one on the right, the gentleman on the right and the lady sitting with Paul both burst into tears because they were so, so grateful. The gentleman on the right was actually down on his knees crying and it just... And sorry if I, if I start to cry, but um, I just couldn't believe how powerful this was for these people to have the Bible in their own language. I, I couldn't believe how much it moved me, watching them engage in their own language. People who may never have even read the Bible in their own language, being able to engage on an audio level was just truly profound and had such a huge effect that's the Proclaimer, which you, Jonathan would have played for you last week. And apologies for those that weren't here. We didn't bring one with us this evening, but Louise will play some audio through the app. And I just wanted to share with you a couple of stories that really moved me during this trip. Um, because like I said, they were incredibly, incredibly profound moments. But this young man, his name was Tristan. And I met him in one of our first stops called Armata. And I sat down with Tristan as we were praying, uh, playing the proclaimer. And I said to him, what does it mean 
to hear the Bible in your own heart language. And you may be able to see he has an English Bible in his hand. And he said, I know God loves me because the Bible tells me. But now I know how God loves me because he's speaking straight to my heart. And it just, as he started to tear up, I started to tear up. And I just thought, what an incredible privilege to be able to see the effect that this is having on people's lives. We know God's word transforms and changes lives, but this is transforming on a whole other level. This is transforming straight to the heart of people. I often didn't understand when people would say to me that spoke a language other than English, oh, I don't know how to say that word in English. And I used to think, how, how can you not know? And somebody said to me, well, it can't, I can give you a word that's similar, but it doesn't do the meaning of the word justice if I give you this different word. And it was really brought home with me through going to this launch and just seeing the way people interacted and particularly when Tristan said to me, now I know how he loves me. He's filling up my spirit. And then I said, okay, so what do you think this is going to do for your community? And he pointed off into the distance and he said, you see those fellas over there? And there were some young men playing basketball. And I said, yeah. And he said, there's no more excuses. They can't pretend they don't know anymore. This is not somebody else's God. This is our God talking straight to us. And we are listening to Revelation at the time and he said to me, this is God talking about when he's coming back and we need to listen. There's no more excuses now. They can't pretend they don't hear. And I thought, wow, there's an unwritten loophole that because it wasn't in their own language, they'd almost shunned it or put it aside as something else that was being forced upon them, particularly the younger generations. The older generations, very similar to Groot, outside churches, heavily influenced by women, although there were quite a few men as well, but just in love with God. But it was the younger generations as well. And when I heard Tristan say that to me, I thought, wow, an unwritten loophole that we're now able to work together to start closing and hopefully bring more young men and women to Christ. There was also another young girl who unfortunately I couldn't take a photo in the community where I met her, but her name was Rachel. And we pulled up in the community store and Rachel said, what are you mob doing here? And I told her what, what we were doing and I said to her, do you have a phone? And she said, yeah, it's at home charging. I said, oh, well, if you go home and grab it and bring it down, I can put the app on your phone for you because I'd become a technical genius by this point dealing with phones. And so um, this was about 12 days in, let me tell you. So um, Rachel was also started to tell me about this beautiful Bible that her grandmother had put together for her. So her grandmother had hand-drawn pictures, Bible stories, and written the Bible verses, and so it made her a makeshift Bible in Pijanjara. And so I, she said to me, would you like to see it? And I said, I'd love to see that. What a fabulous legacy. Beautiful. Please bring it down. And so we had the proclaimer playing as we were going about our business in putting um, the app onto phones. And Rachel came walking down the road, and she started crying. And I was just like, how powerful is your word, God? How powerful is your word that it has this effect? And it is. But what I didn't know is that Romans was playing at the time. And we had a lovely lady, her name was Kanjapay Armstrong, who recorded some of the translation. And she got through four, four chapters of Romans before, unfortunately, she passed away. Now, in what was absolutely a God-ordained moment. That was playing as Rachel was walking down the road and as Rachel started to cry, she said to me, that's my grandmother. That's the one I, sorry, that's the one I was telling you about that raised me up, that made me the Bible, that made me the book. Four verses, completely a God-ordained moment because there is no way I could have planned that if I even tried not knowing that God knew exactly how to speak to her in that moment by her being able to hear her grandmother. And so here we are, another young lady on her knees, just so, so grateful for the word of God, for her now to continue that journey with her grandmother being able to speak to her, and it may only be four verses, but that will now be able to speak to her for the rest of her life. She will always have her grandmother telling her that. And not only that, she said, now my children 
can hear her as well. So I want you to know that this, we're so grateful for your partnership with us. The effect that this has had on communities from the little bit of time that I spent there was overwhelming. They're so wanting revival with God. They're so wanting reconnection. And the older people are fighting for it for the younger generations. And they know that this is a huge step forward in now having their oral language back for all to hear. So thank you so, so much. And please know that this is only the tip of the iceberg for what's happening out there. It's only a few stories and Louise will share some more. But please know that you are absolutely helping to make a huge difference in these communities. Um, and just to uh, this side here, we actually received from Faith Comes by Hearing, who actually helped with the audio, um, and this was some feedback that they got. And you can see on that graph on the right, um, you can see that's from January through to November of last year. Those last three bar bars, I guess show from September, October, November. And so you can see, we, I mean, we launched the audio in September. So you can see from that was the distribution to it. And even since then, in, in November and October, people have still been downloading the app. Um, I think there's something like what we said, 1,305 different engagements with mm. that particular app of people downloading. Um, and you can see it's even actually been downloaded in nine different countries. So I'm not sure... <laughs> given that it's Fijitado, it's a central desert language, um, why people in other places have downloaded it. Um, Faith Comes by Hearing is located and based in Albuquerque, so that may explain one of the American downloads, but I just think it's fascinating that, that um, people from even countries other than Australia are, are interested in engaging with the app. Um, so that was just a little bit of information for you. Obviously the impact and that's why Sarah came as well to share the impact um, that it's had even just doing the recording sessions had a huge impact but then to be able to see it go out and see it touch people and we were able to give proclaimers every community we went to we were able to leave a proclaimer uh, with recordings at the school at the um, nursing homes at the ch and with the churches in those communities. Mm. Um, which was really, I think, really important. Um, just my own little story of, of impact. So those three ladies there, Inawinji, Juliata and Nami, are three Pichitara translators that I work with in Adelaide. Um, this story is about Nami, who's the lady in purple. Um, when I got back to Adelaide after the distribution tour, um, I played Nami a little piece of the audio from my phone, which I'll play you a little bit now and hopefully you'll be able to hear it okay because and I played it from Mark so I picked her up in the car and I said oh see if you can recognize this and so I played it to her So I, I, I handed it over to her and I let her listen to it because I knew that she had done the narration of the Gospel of Mark. And she's sitting there listening to it and I'm driving to the church where we do our translation work. And she's, I could hear her, Hua, Hua, which is, yes, mm. it's good. And uh, then when we got to the, the car park and I, I turned the car off, I looked over and it was only then that I realised she had tears streaming down her face. And I said, Nami, are you all right? She said, Hua, Hua. And, I, I, and she said, now my kids and my grandkids, long after I'm gone, will be able to hear me telling them mm. about Jesus. So for her, it was a, it was a question of, of legacy, of leaving something behind that could tell the next generation about Jesus. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to encourage you that that particular project had a huge impact, so much so that I've had people come to me from other organisations, other groups, saying, we want, we're want working in this language, we want to do the same thing you did. We want to do a recording like that. I've had um, people from Fink River Mission in Central Australia say, we love what you did, we love the distribution tour, we love the fact we can see getting out into the churches. Um, can you help us do a similar thing? So 
it's it's a project that's just going to grow and grow more and more as as hopefully more and more languages will be able to experience what the Pichinjara people were able to experience. Now the second project that you partnered with us in um, from last year was uh, with Noongalinga College. So it was interesting that Langdon mentioned Noongalinga. Uh, we've had a history with Noongalinga College. They're a Bible, a theological Bible college in Darwin. They're run by the Anglican Uniting and Catholic Churches. So it's a wonderful partnership um, of those churches. And uh, we approached them a few years ago because we saw a need for Bible translators to have some formalised training. We were wanting them to do these wonderful translations, but there wasn't, at, at that point, there wasn't any formal training that they could do. So we we approached Nungalinka College and we said we'd love to be able to partner with you to do some training for these translators. And uh, fortunately for us, um, they were very keen. And, uh, and since then, we've had other organisations come on board as well. So we've had Uniting Churches come on board, the Anglican Church in the Northern Territory. A lot of different organisations have all said, yes, we can see that this is a need and we want to help out. So this year was the first intake. Um, I believe there was 17 students. That, and uh, it's a certificate four course, which means that there is a prerequisite. So the students that have come in have actually already uh, completed a certificate three in ministry course. So they're already used to studying. Um, so that started this year. I was actually fortunate enough to go along up to Darwin and meet with the first intake of students. And uh, boy, were they eager. They were a really eager bunch. So that's, that's a, a photo of them there. Um, all the different students, they had 17 students, nine different languages involved. So, uh, Barada, Tiwi, Creole, Kupapanyu, Chukapanyu, uh, Javapunyu, Wangari, Waramia, Mog, and Dangumi were the nine languages involved in that class. So, can you imagine if we have translation projects in all those languages? And a lot of those languages we already do have translation projects, but how much more is going to be encouraged by being able to be trained and facilitated. Um, now, I think the next slide. So, this is a video I wanted to play for you. Um, the, the video is actually um, based on a workshop that was not actually part of the diploma, but a workshop for a specific software application that they use called Adapted. But the reason I wanted to play the video is because the Aboriginal people that appear in the video are actually diploma students and they share a little bit about their passion for having a Bible in their own language. So I wanted, rather than me tell you, I wanted to be able for them to tell you in their own words. So I just want to watch. So I, I hope that just uh, helped you to see the passion that there is um, amongst these translators and they want to be trained and they want to be able to, to do good translations um, for their community. Um, and this is just some of the feedback as well from um, Ben, who's the principal of Nogalini College, and Mally, who was involved as a translation consultant. So Mally says, while most of the students in the other courses finish their classes at 2.30, the Bible translation, translating students continue to work through to 3 or 3.30 just to ensure that they get the coursework completed. They are that keen. And Ben said, beginning the diploma of translating has been an absolute blessing and a joy for the college. Communities have been aspiring for an accredited translation course for many years both to support and re-energise Bible translation ministries, but also to discover new possibilities of working with digital technologies and methods. The first cohort of students is truly an outstanding group of committed and long-serving workers for the Kingdom, and we have all benefited from their time with us at Nugalinya. In 2019, the UN Year of International Languages, are, we are both proud and excited to see where God will lead the community leaders in the future. So that's something that you as a congregation can be proud of, that you have helped support and train these translators. Um, part of this project, part of this course, this diploma, was that we, as a steering committee, as a group, 
decided it would be good to have some in-community training as well. So for people that can't leave their communities and travel and, and um, stay at Nungalinya for the, for the training, and also for those that may not have a Certificate 3 or have, have done previous study but are keen translators, we wanted to be able to do some training, some unaccredited units with them as a way to equip them or a way to introduce them into doing more study um, in the future. So this year we've planned two workshops in community. One is it will be in Manangrida, which is in West Arnhem, and the other one will be in Alice Springs, which is a Central Australia um, region. So we're hoping to have some Pichinjara speakers, some Aliawa speakers, Western Aranda. There's a few languages um, that we're hoping will come along. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to doing that as well. So that's something additional. Is that going to go on? Oh, there we go. Um, and just in addition, um, Jonathan Harris mentioned to me um, about uh, the trip to Groot Island that Langdon had, had made and, um, and knowing also Julianne's uh, connection through her father. Um, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about Groot Island um, and the language there. So um, Bible Society in 1992 um, helped publish the Alandaliakwa Bible, or mini Bible it is, um, and uh, recently it's interesting, um, Reverend Colleen that uh, Langdon mentioned, she's actually been a very busy little translator and she's completed, as well as what's in this, she's also completed the Gospel of John and the Gospel and Acts and she's also done a, um, a draft that's undergoing checking at the moment of Revelation. So we're hoping to um, revise this. Um, so basically this was done in uh, 92 and since then there's been no revisions and they've actually, there's no more of these left. This is the only one I have because um, when I said to Jonathan that I would bring it, he said, oh, can we, can we show it for the expo? And I said, no, I've got to take it back to Adelaide because I need it as a reference for when we do the reprint. Um, so that's something, I guess, that when you're thinking about Greek Island, you can, you can be praying for as well, that there's a, an interest in Bible translation there amongst the church there. We also helped um, just recently um, help them produce a Christmas book in Alandaliakra as well. So um, I just want to encourage you, if you do want to partner with Groot Island, with the, the, the ladies there, the ministers there, they're wonderful people and I think it's re a really good thing to connect and to build that relationship and partnership. Um, and they have a passion for, for the Bible and a passion for Jesus. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to share that little bit with you. Um, oh, and the other thing is we're also hoping to have one of those unaccredited workshops on Groot next year, but that is dependent on the new CMS couple and a few other things. So, um, but that's we're hoping that, yeah. So there's 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 things happening, um, and I think it's really exciting um, as a congregation to be able to to as you're saying not just not just send the money, but actually to connect, to be involved in prayer, obviously, but even to to go as well is really really important. Um, and now we have just questions and answers. If um, I think Peter was going to see if there were any questions. We'll take some questions from the floor. Um, Al, can you grab the mic over there and look after that side if um, there's questions come from over there? So, um, do we have any questions for Sarah and Louise? I'm sure we do. This has happened at all of the other ones, so slow, <laughs> slow starters, everyone's shy. It's okay, it means we gave all the great information. <laughs> You're on. Can you, is it working? Yeah. I was just wondering, with translation work, him. Is it coming? With translation work, um, how do you ensure the accuracy? You say it's undergoing checking. Like if I was thinking my experience with Bible studies and that, and the reference back getting the English right from the original translation and the references backwards, 
that sometimes the English isn't right. So how do, how do you ensure the correct translation when first being translated and who's checking and you know, how do they work out exactly what it means in a different language? That, that's a really good well, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and uh, what usually happens with translation process is, um, for example, with the Pitanjara, um, we have what's called a front translation, which is a usually a simplified English translation that we use. And that's um, been modified by a group of front translators. So, say, for example, with the Pitanjara, we have a group of English speakers that also speak Pichinjara, so Paul's involved in that and a few others, and they, um, because a lot of Aboriginal grammar is very different to English grammar, so there's often a lot of confusion and things like that, and um, abstra uh, Aboriginal languages don't usually have abstract nouns, so there are certain sentences, for example, um, when Timothy and Silas are in prison, and there's an earthquake and the, the prison guard comes in and, and, and says, what must I do to be saved in the English? In a, a front translation, they would say that that sentence would become, what must I do for God to save me? Just to make it clearer for an Aboriginal person. And so we have a front translation and then our translators translate from that English translation into Pichinjara or whatever language and then different translators translate from that Pichinjara back into English, which is a back translation. And then what happens is we have translation consultants that Bible Society provides, and they are um, specialised in both the Greek and Hebrew texts. And then they look at the back translation and they ask the translators questions and they check to make sure that the meaning from the original Greek and Hebrew texts is coming through. So they're the sort of quality control that checks the translation and then when they are satisfied and have signed off that it's a good translation, that the meaning is conveyed, then um, Bible Society they then will publish. But we won't publish any, any scripture until it has been signed off by a translation consultant, qualified translation consultant. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, like, because a lot of people often will say to me, "Oh, your Bible translators, do they know the Greek and the Hebrew?" And and unfortunately, I mean, some of our translators know five different languages, but it's normally not Hebrew or Greek. So, um, yeah. And translation takes a long time because there are lots of checks. I've been working with some uh, Pitjantjara ladies, and some of the drafting. I think we've done four or five different drafts. Four or five different people have looked at. Pitjantjara people have looked at it and drafted it and drafted it and drafted it before it even gets to do a back translation. So it's a long, long process. Well, uh, Adelaide's got a question. Now, what I want to ask, are you going to do the language in, in the, the Aranta tribe, Albert Namajira's language? Sorry, which language? The, the Aranta. Aranta? Yeah. As in the Aranda? Yeah, up in the Northern Territory. Yes, yeah, so we, we've done um, some Western okay. Aranda and we've done also some Eastern Aranda. So there were the two different... Okay. Yes. Now, another thing I want to ask you, when I went back to see my mother's people for, for the first time after 80 years of my life, they were teaching the young kiddies to speak their own language, the, 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 the elders and the young mothers. They're, all the young kiddies are teaching their own, their own native language. That's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. That's fantastic. And actually this year, thank you Adelaide for that, this year um, is the United Nations, I think it said on there, the United Nations Year of Indigenous Languages. And so there's been quite a, a push through media and even through government and things like that to encourage Indigenous languages. And it's wonderful, uh, we've got a Bible... Alex brought, which is the um, Gospel of Luke in Noongar language, which is a uh, region around Perth, southwest Western Australia. And that language was considered a damaged language because for generations, um, children were sent home with notes telling their parents that they weren't to speak Noongar to their children. And the language was forbidden. Um, a lot of dam damaged language, very, very, very sad. And uh, But fortunately, um, 
we were able to, we were very privileged to be able to work with some Noongar speakers and to translate into the Gospel of Luke. And we're actually working now at doing a Gospel of Ruth, a Gospel of Ruth, the Book of Ruth from the Old Testament this year. So, um, and with that, you've got um, the, the Noongar translation, it's also got the back translation, the English back translation, as well as a word list. And so they're actually using that text to help teach younger children to speak Noongar. So it's, yeah, it's really exciting. I know. Julianne. Is it true that um, the pe people who are doing the translation courses, some of them then go on to help their, their other Indigenous people in the communities to read their own language, not just for the purposes of the Bible, but for other community gatherings and purposes? Is that, is that right? Can you yes. tell us a little bit about maybe an example of that? Um, yeah, it's interesting actually because I noticed that many, if not all, of the Indigenous ministers in the Northern Territory, may not be all, but most of them started as Bible translators. They actually were involved in translation process and through that, grappling with the scriptures, they felt a call to ministry. Um, and you'll often find that the Bible translators are also key leaders. So a lot of them, a lot of our Pitch and Jarrah translators are teachers at the school and they do translation on their weekends or they do translation on their holidays. They're always saying, come up and run a workshop during the school holidays because that's, you know, that's when we want to do our translation work. So, um, but yeah, and they're already going into schools, reading with the kids. Um, the, the Christmas book, the Alan Diliakwa Christmas book that we did, we sent that up just before Christmas, sent it into the schools and we had um, a lot of the ladies in the schools reading it to the children and they were the ones that had translated it and then they were able to see the kids colouring it in and, and reading it. So, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I can't think of exact examples but there are so many that I've seen where, where people who have been involved in the translation are then involved in teaching the Sunday school or, and there's a desire for children's resources. So there was the Christmas book. We also do what's called a God Story for the Outback which is basically a Bible overview. Um, it's a colouring book for children so it starts at creation and goes right through to revelation um, and uh, we've done it I think in eight different indigenous languages now we've translated it and that's one of the first things if I have someone come to me and say they want to they want to you should, often say oh we want to we want to translate the bible but to translate the whole bible takes a long time so I usually say well what if we start with this children's Book because we could translate that very quickly and then get it out into the community and then we can look at maybe doing a gospel just to ease them into the process. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, they, they're really excited about it. I'm working with one lady who we've just done a God story in Adnamatna, which is Flinders Rangers language, and we've just recorded her reading it. So we're going to have the book available with the audio available as well so kids can listen to it as they read along. Thanks, Louise. I think Roger's next. Yes, I, I think the um, technology is wonderful, the apps and the phones, but I was wondering how many people can afford a phone and how do they recharge the phone? Is there solar technology or something? Did you want to... Well, I'm happy to answer it, but... <laughs> um, I was actually quite surprised by the amount of people that had phones. And... Um, the Proclaimer can be solar powered, which was the, one of the great pieces about the Proclaimer, but the, their phones are just recharged how we would normally recharge them. Um, but you'd be surprised, pretty much everybody has a phone. Everybody has one. A lot of them weren't charged, so we were charging them in the back of the four wheel drive. <laughs> Praise God, we brought lots of charging cores with us, um, or they'd run out of storage, but pretty much everyone had a phone, and that's why the app played such a huge part. And you can see from those numbers. So something I didn't say was we actually got the app onto just over 150 phones. Oh, no, sorry, 150 proclaimers, just over 300 phones, mm -hmm. yet it's been accessed over 1,500 times nearly. So just incredible that the reach that those apps have had, and that's the whole reason that the app was available, just knowing that going into community to make it available for everyone. I noticed a lot of uh, 
Elko Island people in the video there, and uh, saw the Jamapunyu New Testament that you had on the shelf uh, with the other Bibles. Um, just was keen for an update on where translation was for Jamapunyu language. Yeah, well, um, there has been talk of uh, revision um, of Jamapunyu, um, and yeah, so and, and I think because. Yeah, we're definitely looking at a revision in the next couple of years. Um, but other than that, I don't know. So no Old Testament? There, there has been talk about doing some Old Testament. Um, what I often find with Indigenous ministry is that sometimes there's talk of things, but it may not eventuate. So what I tend to do is try and encourage and scatter seeds and say, how about maybe we'll look at this and maybe we can do this and, and then just see what comes of it because you can't force or push. Um, so, uh, But my hope is with the diploma course as well that uh, I know um, Maricha who was one of the key translators, he's had some health issues and hasn't been well um, and so has his wife. Um, so that, that's another factor that as our, our translators are ageing and um, having health issues and things like that, um, which is another reason to do this course to try and encourage the next generation. We're getting younger translators coming up that need training. Um, so, yeah, my hope is that as other people will be able to pick up and, and run with it. But it's really, we're really dependent on our Indigenous translators for whatever language, because we can't do it without them. So it's really, yeah, we, we, we offer them the opportunity and, and see if they'll be willing to take it. Um, my husband and I, we were teaching on Elk Island for the last couple of years, so um, I just wanted to echo your enthusiasm about the incredible benefit of the audio Bible out of, I think in the two and a half years we were there, I could count on one hand the number of people with the literacy to be able to read the mm -hmm. Jambapunyu Bible and so we found an app, I don't know if it's a Bible Society app, that had a few passages, five fish. Yeah, five that fish. Were, That's not Bible Society. Okay. But, it, it, yeah, it's but just the few yeah. passages that were translated into Jumbo Punyu and that we could play in our classroom, we could play when we met together for fellowship, was so um, well received and so incredibly useful. So to be able to hear a language that very, very few people can actually read Mm. Um, and yeah, it's very, very valuable. Mm. We've actually got a um, God story for the outback in Jabarapunyu as well. So that's just a, a new resource. I think that came out only a few years ago. Um, but uh, and the other thing is, um, we've also got. It's not a Bible Society website. It's actually a partnership website. So Bible Society, Wycliffe Bible Translators, OSIL, which is the Australian Society for Indigenous Languages have all put, come together and created a website called, it's www.aboriginalbibles.org.au. Um, Alex got some cards there. And that website has all the published scripture uh, of Indigenous languages in Australia. Unfortunately, there's only one Indigenous language that has a complete Bible, and that's the Creole language. Um, but there are, I think, something like 20 or 30 different languages that have some form of scripture and they're all on that website. So if, you, if you're interested to know what's out there, you can jump on that website. There's a um, drop down box that says select your language and you click on it and it'll show all the different languages um, that have scripture and you can click on it and it'll take you to a page and it will show you what's available. And there's also, I think, a digital um, Jabarapunyu Bible. So any Bible that's got text, there's digital text for it and there's also what the ones that have audio, there's some audio there as well. So um, if you're interested, um, Alec has some cards with that website address on it. Thanks, Lois. Any more questions? Could you, could you explain in detail the, the pro proclaimer, please? What a proclaimer is. Okay. A proclaimer. It's um, it's an audio device. It's about that big, um, and it has a a little flap that comes up. That's a solar panel. It's even got a little hand wind device, so you can hand wind it to, to generate it. And it has a, a charger, 
and it has a few buttons and you push one button and out comes the audio. So in the case of the Proclaimers that we had, it had the Pichinjara audio on it. But you can put a different audio, different languages on it um, and, uh, and you can adjust the volume and things like that. So it's, a, it's an audio device, it's like, almost like a little tape recorder type thing. Um, that um, can play audio. And the reason we took Proclaimers is because, um, as well as the phone app, it was because the Proclaimers are more for sort of group settings. So if you, if you were doing a Bible study, instead of, say, you might want to read the verse, but you also might want to play the verse so people can hear it. Um, in, there was an old folks' home we left, and when we, we left the Proclaimer with them, and as we were leaving, they were all hunched around this table just sitting there listening to these voices because they all knew the voices. As soon as you put it on, they would know who it was. And so for them, where their culture is communicated through storytelling from one generation to the next, it gives a different element when they can, can hear the, the generation speaking to them in a way that makes more sense to them than in a, a book. For us important information is written down in a book. For them it's told orally through story and it's told by someone. And the fact that you've got these key leaders in the community telling them about Jesus is, is an amazing thing. It's more, it has more impact than, than a book. And they were really easy to use. So the proclaimers actually came to us preloaded with the scripture already on them. So they didn't need to do anything but basically turn it on and press play. So really, really easy to use and because of the solar panel being in the centre of Australia, it never runs out of charge. Well, um, Louise and Sarah, thank you so much for coming tonight. Can we please thank them for uh, coming along and sharing with us? <clears throat> Thanks. If you just want to stay here for a moment, and we're just going to finish in prayer, but just what a privilege it is for our church to, you know, we, we don't do a lot in this. I can, uh, can only but imagine the, uh, the effort, the expense, the resources required to make all of this happen. And it's great that we can tip in a little bit that contributes mm. to that. And, um, and my prayer is that for the years to come, we can continue to supercharge this ministry and, and help you guys to continue to do this wonderful work. So with that, um, let me finish the night in prayer. Thank you so much for coming along. And I look forward to seeing you at things later in the week. Lord God, uh, thank you for this night and, uh, and the things that we have heard and seen and the challenges that we have. Uh, Father God, we thank you for the work of the Bible Society in translating your, your word uh, for your mob so that they can hear your story and also as, uh, as a people that we too can use this to bring reconciliation between you and your mob and also us white people and our indigenous forebearers. And so, Lord God... Um, May we be challenged to participate in this ministry as we can, uh, we can serve Louise and Sarah and their teams as they continue this great work um, around our land. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.